Hello, welcome, welcome as people join. Great to have you. Welcome, everyone. We'll just wait for everyone to join in from the uh, waiting room here. Welcome all. Welcome, okay, let's get started. Welcome, thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Creative Freelancing, what you need to know before you begin. Uh, this webinar is hosted by your career services team, serving Yorkville University and Toronto Film School. Here today, you can give us a wave as I call your name. We've got Linda Falster, Heather King Andrews, Snigla Midori, Alexandra Stancato, and myself, Emma Hartley. We offer a range of career support for students and alumni up to six months after you graduate including regular free webinars such as this and that's these are available to all including alumni so please do stay tuned on our social media channels for more details of upcoming offerings uh, we've got loads of great information for you today if you miss anything or have to jump early um, we will be uploading this webinar in its entirety to the toronto film school youtube channel shortly so you can check it out there we're going to be using an app called menti.com throughout today's session so you can join in and interact Instructions will pop up on the screen when we get there and we want to hear from you. So please, please, please do interact, answer the questions and feel free to ask questions throughout today's session. We will have a Q&A at the end. Um, over to you, Alex. Let's get started. Fantastic. Thank Alex, you so thank much, you. Emma, for introducing us. I am going to just get started sharing my screen. Like Emma said, we've got a lot of fantastic information for all of you today. We hope to see you participating and I think we can jump right into it. So I just wanna say again, thanks, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, today, we're gonna to be talking about creative freelancing and what you need to know before you begin. Understanding what freelancing entails, if it's right for you, and best practices can be difficult, especially if it's a new topic to you. And I assume for many of us joining here today, this is a new topic. So I hope you'll have a better understanding of where you might want to start and if it's right for you and what that might look like moving forward after our presentation today. All right. So before we get into it, I think that it's really important we start off with a land acknowledgement for our Toronto Film School campus. So we acknowledge the land that Toronto Film School operates on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with Mississaugas of the Credit, we reaffirm our responsibility to increase awareness and understanding of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people and colonial legacy and commit to strengthening our relationship with Indigenous peoples throughout Canada. I also do want to take this moment to remind everyone that on September 30th, that's this Friday, it's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. This is a day that's meant to honor the children who never returned home and survivors of residential schools, their families and their community. Um, I encourage you all, I'll be doing this, take a moment to educate yourself about the painful history and the ongoing impacts of residential schools uh, and the survivors. And I would, and it would be great if everyone can wear an orange shirt to show your solidarity as well uh, with residential school survivors and the indig indigenous people across Canada. All right, so let's get started with some introductions for myself and Emma, who will be your hosts today. Uh, my name is Alexandra Stancato, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm your career advisor here with TFS. My favorite part of my job is assisting job seekers and creatives like you in preparing for finding and maintaining meaningful employment. I love working with all of our creative students because you are truly looking for work that works for you, work that suits your passions, your interests, your strengths. And that's why I'm always so excited to meet with you all in a space like this webinar today and help you work out how that's going to look and what your career might look like moving forward. So that's a bit about me uh, and I'll pass it on to Emma. 
Thank you, Alex. I'm always excited to co-host, love co-hosting with you. And it's great to see some familiar names in the chat today. Uh, my name is Emma, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the alumni liaison specialist for Yorkville University. And I'm gonna be connecting alumni and current students for mentorship, guidance, and employment opportunities. Uh, my background's in university career advising. And prior to that, I actually worked in film and TV for around 15 years. I have actually freelanced at various points in my career as TV crew, a script reader, and a script editor. I've worked with hundreds of new grads launching freelance careers in the creative industries and today I am excited to help you decide if freelancing is something for you. Back to you Alex. Thank, thank you Emma. All right so we have a lot to cover today. I'm just going to quickly go over our agenda. We're going to start off with our first topic all about if freelancing is right for you. What is freelancing? How does it differ from being self-employed? What are the pros? What are the cons? And what do you need to consider before getting started? That's going to lead us right into the second topic how to get started, questions to ask yourself before you dive in, how to do some market research, and taking those first steps. The third topic is one that people always seem to have questions about, and that's freelancing and money. How do those two things fit together? What does being paid look like? How can you manage your finances as a freelancer? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And then we'll head into our last topic, all about your rights and, re and responsibilities as a freelancer. Then we're gonna wrap up our session today with a little bit of a Q&A. So you know a little bit about us and now we would love to know a little bit about you all. So like Emma shared earlier on today, I'll please go to www.menti.com. We'll be asking you questions throughout today's presentation. And we wanna know, what creative field do you want to work in? Um, the code is at the top of the screen. It's 6634-6484. I'm already seeing a few here. Some of you are really speedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got graphic design. We've got film and TV. Fantastic. I'll give it a couple of moments for the rest of you here. Ah, a screenwriter. Amazing. Acting. Right. Wow, it's like I'm seeing every single one of Toronto Film School's programs up here on screen. Up. This is we up for you, Alex. <laughs> yeah, this is fantastic. Great. Very broad. I'm glad to see it. And I think you'll all find our presentation helpful today. All right. So with that, I am going to pass the presentation on to Emma, and she's going to kick us off with the first topic. Let's get started. So before we put the cart before the horse, let's pause for a moment to reflect on whether freelancing is a good option for you at this time. So freelancing is defined as doing particular pieces of work for different organizations rather than working all the time for a single company. So side hustles, gig work, solopreneurship, short-term contract work, all of these have become really increasingly common and visible over recent years. Uh, many creators in design, so if we've got website graphic designers, I think we have here, obviously film and TV crews, screenwriters included, uh, animators, IT pros, researchers, editorial writers, resume writers, and more and more and more, all of these uh, professions may find themselves in freelance careers. Now, you're not working for any one employer, but you're hiring out your specialized skills and services to multiple clients. It's also worth noting here that freelancing differs from entrepreneurship in that the skills and services freelancers offering are actually, they are the business. You're not selling a product or an idea. Now you might call yourself a freelancer, you might call yourself an entrepreneur or an independent contractor or a gig worker. Really the only label that matters is the dis dis distinction you make to Canada revenue come tax season. And they want to know, are you an employee or are you self-employed? So employment status directly affects your entitlement to EI, employment insurance, under Employment Insurance Act, and can also have an impact on how you are treated under other legislation as a worker. Now, key question to ask when you take on work is, are you being engaged to carry out services as a person in business on your own account, or are you being engaged as an employee? So when you take on work, really define and ask yourself if you and the party are entering into a contract of service, employer, employee, or a contract for services, a business relationship. Now, if you set your own hours, if you get paid after delivery of a service, if you take on a lot of short-term contracts, if you're financially responsible by setting your own rates, all of these probably point to the fact that yes, you're likely a freelancer. 
I read a really great uh, definition on TurboTax, thought it was really um, great breaking this down, which is that you're self-employed if you operate a business where you are the business, right? So freelancers, consultants, rideshare drivers, contract writers, if you do dog walking as a side gig, if you sell your veggies at a local uh, farmer's market, congratulations, you're self-employed, you likely have a small business. Now, if you're interested in learning more about legal self-employed definitions, your first stop should be Canada Revenue's website. And it's got loads of information on there that really breaks it down. Sometimes people are mislabeled by those that are working for as self-employed as a freelancer. And actually, they're really an employee and you're entitled to lots of benefits as an employee. So if you think you've been mislabeled, if you're like working constantly for the same person as short term contracts and you're getting paid that way and you're experiencing none of those benefits, then do speak with an employment lawyer. The Canadian Bar Association has a list of pro bono legal advice clinics. And additionally, many lawyers will offer free consultations before going forward with their services. Now, again, let's jump back on a mentee, get to know a little bit more about you. If you're joining us today, it's because you are a freelancer or you're really curious about it. So what is most attractive to you about a freelance career? Again, jump on mentee. The code is at the top, 6634-6484, and tell us why you're interested in it. You want to choose your own hours. You want to work anywhere. I know folks, I know some writers who work on beaches and I am massively jealous. Uh, you can choose your own clients, variety of work, be your own boss, all of the above or other. We've got a good spread here. It's a nice little rainbow there. We've got um, folks who want to work anywhere. They like the variety, be your own boss or all of the above. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think, I think working anywhere, <laughs> like the beach option during February, I think variety of work we've got everyone represented there working anywhere i'm with you i'm with you thanks for answering everyone i love to see this okay so um throughout today's session uh, we've peppered uh, today's webinar with quotes from established freelancers in creative field we're really grateful thank you to our pros for these gems of wisdom that's going to give you some practical advice and insight on establishing your freelance career so Corey Gray is a graphic designer. I know he has some designers in the, in the, uh, on the webinar today. And he has over 20 years of experience in the advertising industry. He's also a design educator. Yes, he's part-time faculty at TFS. And he's also at, at Centennial, Humber and Durham College since 2014. Corey is very active in the advertising industry and works as a freelance designer in agencies across the city. Corey tells us that a great advantage to freelance work is being your own boss and wearing many hats to get the job done. The extra income stream can help you get in head in life or fill in the gaps with contract work. So that's um, some, of the, some of the advantages, some of the upsides as we've seen we voted on and something uh, Corey's talking about here. But let's look at the sort of downsides potentially, not every day in freelancing is gonna be sunshine and roses. So what do you think some of the downsides to being your own boss may be? Tell us again in menti.com. Again, you should be able to just log on on 6634-6484 on menti.com. What do you think some of the drawbacks may be or some of the things that you're considering? It's kind of the balance view to this. Having problems with the internet. Yeah, you, you're supplying your own Wi-Fi. You're supplying your own website hosting. You've got to keep the lights on in, sort of, in many different ways. Job security, yes, yeah. Unstable income, long working hours, no paid stat holidays. Yeah, your sick days, your vacation days, those are on you. No benefits, yeah, and the income stability. Yes, all wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing everyone. These are really great 12 hour work days, yeah, yeah. And if you're going into film and TV, those long, <laughs> those long days on TV, and TV and film sets are the reality. Yeah, you've got to spend more on your internet, your electricity, your gas, no EI. Yeah, all of these are worth considering. Thank you everyone for sharing. These are fantastic. You've obviously given some thought to this. So again, we've got a quote from um, one of our pros here is uh, Clayton Wheeler is a senior art director in the advertising industry. He's been doing freelance graphic design and art direction work for the past 10 years and a bit more of a balanced view on some of the tougher parts of freelancing careers as actually some of you have shared with us today. As amazing as the free freedom of freelancing is, you have to prepare financially for the possibility of inconsistent work. In advertising, there are seasons with increased demand, such as the holidays. There are also seasons where everything slows down. It might be difficult to find work. 
If you're just starting out, it's really important you have a plan to support yourself during the times with team projects. So again, each industry is going to have its ebbs and flows. Interestingly, my background is film and TV. When it gets cold, so like around the holidays, January, or February, cold and dark, that's when the industry tends to slow down. So again, each industry has its own ebbs and flows and it's worth doing your research. Okay, let's cap this off with a little bit of a pros and cons list. Um, not exhaustive, of course, and I really encourage that you make your own pros and cons because your personality, values and interests are really going to differ. Let's have a look here, though. On the upside of freelancing, you have a lot more control than as an employee. You have control of your time and which clients or projects you work on. You don't have to say yes to everything. You may have gained much more flexibility of when, how and where you work. A lot of freelance careers mean solo work, which can mean greater independence. You may find yourself with much more variety of work, so different projects, clients, locations and opportunities. And finally, exposure. If you can work with lots of different clients and teams during the year, you potentially get to know a lot of people in your industry in a shorter amount of time than you would as an employee. This is really great for networking and getting your name out there. Now, on the flip side, as you've mentioned today on the Menti, there's a lot more risk. So you're the one who has to keep the lights on, so to speak, during the slow period, recessions, shifts and changes in your field. You have to be comfortable with a certain amount of financial risk and uncertainty. As an employee, you will often have access to certain benefits, such as paid sick days, health insurance, pension plans, employee assistant programs, and so on. As a freelancer, these expenses are now out of your business pocket which means that you're also assuming a much higher level of financial responsibility. You've got to track your spending, issue invoices, file taxes, and this can be a real mind shift if you're, especially if you're a creative, which I'm sure many of you are. So if you're not used to doing that, that can be quite a shift in working. You can be wearing many hats. So boss, creative, marketer, accountant, HR, and more. You not only have to provide the service, for example, you know, website design, but then you also have to go out and hustle for the clients or your next job, your next gig. If your role is done what is one that's done remotely and alone, it's worth considering if the sort of isolation of working is something that really fits with and is conducive to your personality values and needs. Is it an upside or a drawback for you? So I hope this gives you a bit of food for thought. It's really, as I said, worth drawing up your own pros and con list before you dive in. Okay, I'm gonna kick it back to Alex to um, lead us to our second segment. Thank you very much, Emma. So now that you know a little bit about freelancing, the upsides and the drawbacks, the first step to getting started is making sure that it's right for you, right? And so you really want to ask yourself some questions, do a deep dive in and really assess, you know, is this the right option for me? I, I highly recommend you take a screenshot of this slide or a photo so that you can go through each of these what questions one by one and in depth, but I wanna draw attention to them. So the first question that you really wanna ask yourself is what kind of projects do you like and dislike working on? I also wanna add that you might wanna consider what type of projects do you feel comfortable working on for clients? For example, maybe you are someone who really loves motion graphics, but you don't feel comfortable yet sharing that as a service that you're being paid for. Consider what other areas you like and are good at, like print design or layouts or logos, whatever that might look like for you, and build those motion design skills on the side or through volunteer work so that you can gain that portfolio food and that confidence. You don't need to jump into everything right away. You also want to ask yourself, do you need part-time, full-time, or seasonal work right now? This is such an important question, as it can really take time to build up your client base and get consistent work as a freelancer. So you might want to work part-time or a seasonal job to support your career as a freelancer. Ask yourself, what do you want your days to look like? One thing that people often forget is a freelancer's day incorporates numerous additional tasks that traditional employees are not usually responsible for, like setting your own work hours, keeping track of the time spent on different projects, billing clients, paying your employment and business taxes, um, focusing on your social media, generating those leads. Is that what you want your day to look like? Does that excite you or does that not excite you? Those are all things to think about. Ask yourself, are you comfortable with financial risk? 
Some people prefer consistency, being paid every other week. Other people feel okay with that risk. If you do need to look inward to your finances, how can you do that? Can you create a plan or a budget? Maybe it looks like, you know, saving up for the next few months, saving up for the next year so that you can feel more comfortable getting started as a freelancer. Um, and, you know, you ask yourself that question, what can you do to mitigate that financial risk? For example, I know a freelance videographer. He often works in the summertime. There's a lot of events going on in the summer, a lot of weddings, a lot of gigs for him to shoot. However, he sees a quieter times in the spring or in the fall, and he'll pick up part-time work in a camera shop so that he can continue to build his freelance client base, but also be financially secure. So that's something you do want to think about. Ask yourself as well, what other needs do you have to take into account? Do you have childcare needs? You know, oftentimes freelancers say they're working more than 40 hours a week, right? Because you're a business owner, you're your own, you know, you're an owner of, you know, you're doing all of the different tasks beyond just the assets you're creating or the project you're working on to really build your clientele. So you want to ask, do you need childcare? Do you need accommodations for disability? Do you have pressing financial needs that need to be taken care of immediately? These are important questions. And finally, what do you still need to research to make an informed decision? Make a list. It's super important that we get through all of that before you get started. So I have another fantastic quote here from Fritz K. Park. Some of you might know him. He's TF TFS faculty, and he also has been working in the, the design industry for the past 16 years. Um, he's worked multi-agencies, multinational companies, all while maintaining his own design firm and freelancing business. Fritz really wanted to share with you all today that it's important to find out as much information as you can before you go into freelance work. If you can, try it out as a side job first to prospect it as something you can do full time. And I think that's great advice. All right. So now you're going, you know, you've asked yourself all of those different questions. And you're going, yeah, I think this is something I could do. Now it's important to do market research. Across the world, uh, according to Mono Solutions, we're continuing to see an increased demand in freelance laborers. And that's good news for all of you who are deciding, yes, this is something I might want to do. But it's important to learn about the labor market and what it looks like to position yourself the best you can in today's working world. So there are a bunch of questions up on screen that you're going to want to find the answers out to. You'll want to learn, are most workers in your field self-employed or employees? What does the day-to-day -day look like for freelancers in your line of work? Are there traditionally slow times? Like Emma said, in film, the winter is quite slow. Whereas, um, or whereas in advertising, the winter is prime for holiday content and materials. You see it all over social media, all in the stores, right? So ask your, so, so you're going to need to figure out those questions, add those answers to those questions. Where can you find employers or clients who are hiring? You're not going to be able to start a career as a freelancer without knowing where you can find work. What skills or services are in demand? Is the work steady, declining, or increasing in your field of interest? And what societal, technological, environmental, or economic factors are affecting the field and how? Now, you might be going, okay, well, these are fantastic questions. How do I find out the answers? Well, one of the best ways to answer these questions is by meeting with and discussing them with people who freelance in the same area as yourself and those who are already in the industry. There's no better way to learn from the horse to learn than from the horse's mouth or from the person for, or from people who are doing what you want to do. Uh, reach out to your current network. I know that you are working with students who are already freelancing, instructors who have freelancing businesses or have done it in the past, these are the perfect people to reach out to and ask these questions to. You can use LinkedIn to find people who are working in roles and in the field you're interested in as a freelancer and talk and explore with them. 
Um, and you can also use some fantastic labor market websites like Glassdoor. You can head to your professional association websites for your different industries. Um, and if you're confused about where you might head and look for those resources, please reach out to our career services team. We're always happy to help you with getting started in that exploration. All right. So, you know, you've decided this is right for me. I've gathered all this labor market information and I'm ready to get started. I'm ready to start my work as a freelancer. Well, it's really important that you start small, right? You don't want to overwhelm yourself when you get started. And so I recommend getting started by looking inward to your network. Look at your friends and family, your peers in the program, employers and colleagues, profs and instructors. Um, yes, for advice, these people can also be your first clients. Um, working with the people you know, your immediate connections as your first clients is a great place to start because you can be transparent about the process. You can learn how long it takes you to complete each project. You can, you know, explore, grow, um, and, and, and really kind of fine tune what your process might be. You might also consider volunteering. There are tons of opportunities on campus with DFS. I know that our video game students are always looking for writing students to help with character development or scripts. I know that the film production and acting students are always looking for graphic design students to create posters or assets for um, short films or, 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 or plays that are coming up. So look in, look in at TFS. Um, so check out Volunteer Toronto, Charity Village. Those are two fantastic websites for volunteer positions. Um, and this is a great place to get started. You might be wondering why. Why would I do free work? Well, here's the thing you can get something for working for free, right? So you can get a testimonial, you can get a recommendation, that word of mouth referral, and those pieces to add to your portfolio. All of that builds up your reputation and it will make it easier for you to find additional clients down the line. Check out freelancing platforms. There's Fiverr, Upwork, freelancer. And these are all services where you uh, or are all websites where you can market your services to potential clients. And they have a little bit more protection for you as the freelancer and safe payment methods as well. So that might be a way you want to go. Please check out online groups as well. Facebook is a fantastic resource. Yes, to find clients, but to also find support from people who are doing what you're doing, people who have advice for you. If you have questions, you can have that sense of community. Um, I Need a Producer Fixer is great for those of you in the film industry. Uh, Women Who Freelance is a great one. So check them out. Um, and, you know, again, start small as you build up your experience and your confidence. Then that's time where you can scale up. You can get a website. You can use social media to promote your to promote your freelance work. Ask for those word of mouth recommendations and really start to gain momentum. All right. So I think that's enough about me here or enough from me here. I'm going to pass it on to Emma now to get started with our next topic. Lovely. Thank you so much. And on that note, if you are a freelancer looking to collaborate, use the chat here today. You're all sort of in freelancers if you want to connect, as Alex said, if you're a graphic designer, wanting to work filmmakers, etc. Please, you do use the chat to connect with each other today. Uh, so yes, let's move on to money and freelancing, because as a freelancer, you are in ultimate control of your budget, finances and getting paid. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So step one, uh, before you start offering your services to client, it's a really good idea to assess your personal finances so you know how much you need to make for employment to cover your outgoing costs, pay off debts and work towards any saving goal you have. So start with creating a budget by first outlining any income you have. So that might be part time work, babysitting gigs, client work you already have and then your fixed expenses. So those are regular payments that are just unavoidable, rent, phone, internet, insurance, and so on. And then you'll also have variable expenses. These change from month to month. Heating is gonna go up, transit, groceries, eating out, medical expenses, and so on. And then any savings goals you have. So maybe you are trying to save up for a house, a car, uh, retirement or debt repayment. 
if freelancing is going to be your sole source of income, it's also a good idea to budget for an emergency slush fund, really to cover those sort of quiet periods or any unexpected expenses. You can also start by making some well-educated, well-researched guesses on expenses you might need when you start freelancing. So for example, if you're a designer, you may need to start budgeting for your Adobe licenses, or um, maybe you want to get client contracts drawn up and a, re and a lawyer review those quickly. Um, many freelancers here are gonna need their own website and that website hosting costs money. So again, start thinking about those sort of outgoings that you may need as a freelancer. Now for templates and further support on creating a budget, you can check out some of these resources. These are not uh, exhaustive of course, but uh, McGill has this great uh, personal finance essentials course. It's great, it's free. Um, and Government of Canada has a great money management pages, again, with budget templates. You can also start with um, free apps like Mint. I actually just downloaded it last week. And this is a way of being able to track all your outgoings. Again, I've just posted those in the chat for you if you need them. Okay, so um, another quote from a pro, Emily Shuey has over a decade of experience in acting and filmmaking from corporate video to fringe shows, from web series to voiceover work. She has some really great advice for budgeting. What I wish I'd known when I started freelancing was how to better value myself and my work. Know what the going rates are for the job you're doing. Don't be afraid to charge for your skills. I love that advice. And sort of jumping on from that, freelancers, and their rates. Now, you, freelancers will often be asked for their rates by potential clients. So when you're getting started, I know that can be really awkward to say your rate out loud, but you have a skill they need. So just say your number, right? It's really key that you do your upfront research and know your value in the market so that you're being paid fairly. Next slide, please, Alex. So a few considerations to keep in mind as you set your rate. Do you know what others are charging? Okay, so as Emily said, do your research. You need to compare apples to apples, comparing uh, the same job that you do with the same skill level you're at with the same location you work in. Now, ask friends or contacts in the industry who hire uh, freelancers or who are freelancers. Now, our film and TV folks here, you can actually check out union rate cards. So um, WG, Writers Guild of Canada, Directors Guild of Canada, IATSE, which is A-I-T-S-E, or NABET, N-A-B-E-T, and more. Um, you can check out their union rate cards. Now, that just gives you a nice ballpark figure for each role and each department and how much they're making. Uh, by the hour or by project. And this is on the higher end budgets, sure, but at least it gives you something to work with. You can also check out community resources. Again, like Alex said, uh, Facebook groups, big fan of Facebook groups, Women Who Freelance Toronto, Freelancing Females, that group I need to produce is a great way to get some sort of community um, input on what the sort of going rates are in your field. And you will have found, you may have come across these, um, Pay transparency has gained a lot of momentum over recent years as an equity tool, making sure everyone's getting paid what they should be getting paid. Now, a few uh, communities have started open rate resource sheets. This is a sort of Excel spreadsheet anyone uh, can uh, view, but also input like this is what I'm making and this is where I'm working. And, and they are out there. So they haven't been reviewed in any way, but they are a really great research tool as well. And you can email Alex if you'd like to see those. So secondly, uh, to consider is how are you going to charge for your services? Now, you want to make, you might want to consider if it makes more sense for you, your time, your field, to charge by the project, by package of services, or by the hour. So ask yourself, what's most common in my field? Which enables you the independence, flexibility, and profit margin that fits you best? So again, chat to others in your field to learn more about the pros and cons of project versus hourly rates. For our designers here, plan ahead for things such as what you're going to charge for your time. Are you going to charge for things like discovery calls when clients kind of want to talk about their projects and <laughs> get a quote from you? Are you going to charge for that? Or are you at least going to time limit those? Again, things start thinking about how are you going to charge for your time? Another question to ask when it comes to setting your rate is how long does it take to do your work? Whether it's designing a website, editing a resume, giving notes on a script or writing a blog post. Before you even start getting paid, start tracking your time using an app like Toggle, T-O-G-L, to see how long it takes you to complete a project. Then when you start taking on clients, you've got a really clear idea of how long a project takes and you can start adjusting the rate depending on its complexity, the number of revisions needed, research time, creative meetings. Again, you can build into your rate. 
It also really helps um, be very clear with your client about your working hours, your email response times, your turnaround times again. The more upfront you can be, you're establishing really clear boundaries around your time and what you're getting paid for. Now, expenses. You're not a full-time employee, as we've said on the Menti, right? You don't have the luxury of being able to use company equipment, Wi-Fi, sick days, vacation days, etc. So your expenses need to be factored into your rate. Think about what expenses you're going to have as someone is self-employed. If, for example, you're a videographer or a makeup artist and you've already paid out for your kit, your camera kit or your makeup kit, then if someone hiring, if a short film's going to hire you and they say, bring your camera, bring your makeup bag, then your rate should reflect a kit fee or something that's an extra, as well as your skill level and your time. Lastly, who is the client? Now, some freelancers will charge a different rate depending on the client because it could be quite different between a friend you might offer mates rates to, a charity or a nonprofit that you believe in, or a corporation with deep pockets. And your rate can reflect who the client is. Now, worth also noting, some established freelancers have clients on retainer. Now, a retainer is a long-term work for higher contract. That means you're going to get stable monthly income that's guaranteed. You're, you're on call for them, right? And you might offer a deal on your rate for this kind of payment security. These are all things to just consider on a case-by-case -case basis. And when you find your number, just say it, just say it, own it. Um, and you'll find that people will pay you for your skill level. Okay, let's move on to taxes. We need to talk about it. Let's talk taxes. As a freelancer, how much ballpark should you be saving of your income for tax season? Again, get on Mentee, see if you know this. How much should you be saving ballpark for tax season? A, 0%, B, 20%, C, 30%, or D, 50%. What do you think it is? A, B, C, D. 0%, 20%, 30%, 50%. Oh, most people think 30. What are you thinking? Menti.com, 6634-6484. Most people think 30. You're right, you're right. Most financial advisors would give a general rule of putting aside 30% of your total income for tax season so you aren't hit with a bill you can't afford come summer. So as a freelancer, your employer is not taking taxes out of your pay. You're just getting these lumps on, right? So eventually you're going to owe the government their tax money. So think ahead and budget for this as you get paid. It will save you headaches down the line. Now we've got some gold advice from Shante Cunningham, founder and CEO of Cabela Financial, who works with a lot of freelance creators with bookkeeping, coaching and tax advisory. We've got some Awesome advice she recommends to stay as prepared as possible for tax season. Freelance should, should ensure to keep track of income and expenses. This can be done by using an Excel spreadsheet or our accounting software. Freelancers should also keep their receipts for eligible business deductions. And note, each industry is different, so their expenses may be different, especially those in the creative field. So again, really key that you keep organized, detailed documentation when it comes to your income expenses. So some advice. Um, please do track and keep copies of your eligible receipts and expenses. Even before March next year, traditionally tax filing season, you should check what eligible expenses are for you on Canada Revenue's website so you don't miss out on those deductions. Next slide, please, Alex. Um, there are great free and low cost software out there where you can track expenses and handle your invoices, such as Wave, QuickBooks, FreshBooks. Um, you're going to need to prepare those invoices to make sure you're getting paid. If you do use an invoicing software or error, Already, if you are a freelancer, you can tell us in the chat what you use. And if you're a fan, I love it. Sharing is caring. Let's get community mind on this. Um, also tracking your time, which I talked about just before. Track the time you spend on a project. If you're working way more hours on a project than you're billing for, it's time to increase your rate. And again, then you'll know if you need to offer more clarity or boundaries with clients. Um, you'll need to hold on to your records for around six years for Canada Revenue in case you get audited. You also may need to register for HST number once your business takes off. And a little word on that. Again, we'll go back to Shante, who says that, next slide please, Alex, uh, freelancers and self-employed individuals, who, independent contractors, are required by Canada Revenue to register for HST number as soon as your business makes a gross amount of $30,000. So gross is before you deduct all the expenses and tax. So you need to keep an eye on this. Like if you're doing really, really well, keep an eye on this. If uh, as, soon as, um, as soon as you make those 30 grand in 
any three consecutive tax quarters it's really important because if you register for your HST number after making that money in sales, you're going to be liable to CRA for back taxes as of the date it was earned. So again, you need to be able to track and keep on top of everything that's coming in. 30 grand is going to be that, um, that, that, that uh, threshold for when you're going to need a HST number. Okay, there's a lot of information. Again, we will be uploading this webinar to the Toronto Film School YouTube channel if you want to review this again uh, at a later date. Back to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Emma. I think that's all so important. I think money is one of those things that makes a lot of us feel nervous and it can feel overwhelming. Um, and, and, and planning and preparing and budgeting and, and saving, that's really all the best that you can do. Um, and so really being aware of all the services that can help you uh, and the support you can get is going to be, you know, make all the difference. All right, so we're gonna head into our last topic here. We're talking all about your rights and responsibilities as a freelancer. And I really wanna draw attention to the Employment Standards Act. This is the act that provides the basic minimum uh, standards for employees in Canada, it'll vary a little bit uh, province to province, but basically it will cover minimum wage, overtime pay, public holidays, vacation with pay, leaves of absence, and notice of termination or termination pay. I wanna draw attention to this act because those who are not considered an employee are not protected by this act. And I know that a lot of you actually knew this uh, from uh, asking about the drawbacks of freelancing. And for some of you, this might be super, super important. So it is something to consider when deciding if freelancing is right for you and what your freelancing career might look like. For example, there might be a freelance worker who becomes pregnant and wants to take a parental leave, right? But because of this, they will have no guarantee of keeping their clients at the end of their leave. So they need to prepare in different ways, right? It could be budgeting, maybe it's returning to work quicker or finding someone else who can take on clients for the time being or other concessions. So really thinking about how you can prepare for that. Maybe it's putting money away for your vacations or making sure that you, know, you are being paid to cover your overtime pay, right? There's all different things that you might need to do if you're not an employee and you are a uh, independent contractor or freelancer or gig worker um, like that. All right. So I have a true or false question for you all here today. Um, so true or false, a contract has to be written to be legally binding. What do we think? Oh, that one was fast. So we've got one false here. You're speedy. All right, all right. True, two trues, one false. Okay, so we're a little bit divided here. Well, I actually want you all to know, oh, that it is false. So a verbal contract is legally binding. However, I wanna caution you all from using only verbal contracts as a freelancer. A written contract is really, really the best way to protect yourself and to protect the client. So thank you for participating. Let's backtrack here. Let's talk about what a contract is. A freelance contract in simple terms is a legally binding agreement made between two parties, those, those two parties being yourself and your client. It comes after the initial proposal has been shared with the freelancer, so what the client is expecting from you, and before you're at the point of sending an invoice over. It doesn't just protect you, it protects the client as well. So I recommend that all work arrangements begin with a contract, signed by both parties, whether, you know, this is a work arrangement with your, one of your close friends or someone you don't know, a written contract is always best. It details a lot of different, a, a lot of different aspects of what, of the work you'll be doing, how you're going to get paid. And we'll actually talk about that on the next slide here. So there are a lot of different things that are outlined in a contract. I always say the more detail, the better. It's here to protect you. Um, you can actually go online and download free contract templates. There's fantastic advice um, in, in, in various freelancing Facebook groups about how to set up a contract. 
Um, you can reach out to an employment lawyer, a contract lawyer with questions if that's something that you need to do. Um, like Emma shared, there is the pro bono uh, legal resources with the Canadian Bar Association uh, for those types of questions. But I do wanna just quickly go over some things that are important for your contract. Always including your business names and contact details of both parties. Payment details as specific as you can get. What's your pricing structure? Are you being paid hourly? Are you being paid per project? If you're a writer, are you being paid per word? That's something to consider as well. What are your payment dates? What's the price of your work? Each individual part of it, yes, as well as it all together. What's the scope of your work and all of the different project deliverables? What will you be doing? It can be very important to provide revision limits as well. One thing I've heard from freelancers is, oh, when I got started, I wish I knew to provide revision limits. And that's actually how many times you'll go back and edit your work and continue to work on it for the client. You know, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, we all hope we're working for the perfect client who's going to say, yes, I love what you did. That's amazing. No changes are necessary. Unfortunately, that's not always the case, right? You might work with a client who says, you know what? Can you change this? Can you change this? Can you change this? And if you're being paid per project, as example, you might feel like now you've done so much additional work you didn't account for that that price actually isn't uh, worth it anymore. So you want to make sure to include revision limits. Include delivery dates. What dates? Um, are, are, are you planning on sending off uh, assets or different parts of the project? Who has ownership of the project once it's complete? What additional expenses are you, do you need to account for? Uh, like Emma said, it could be that kit fee. It could be your Wi-Fi. Do you need to rent an office space? Do you need to rent equipment or buy different materials? These are all things that should be put into the contract, uh, as well as the termination clause to help you if you want to terminate that relationship with the client and vice versa, if they want to terminate that relationship with you. All right, so moving on to our next topic here is scams. And I want you all to be aware of scams. Unfortunately, scams are very, very common in the world of employment, whether you're an employee or a freelancer. And the best way to make sure they don't happen is to be aware of them. I'm actually curious to hear from Emma. Um, Emma, have you ever had any experience with scams? Yeah, I mean, I've had some phishing scams myself. They were pretty obvious, but I have also worked with students um, in Forma TV who have um, had some sort of dodgy, but kind of sophisticated scams. They've often involved um, checks. So um, I'm gonna pay you, you go out and buy this equipment. I'm gonna pay you by a check. Um, and what they're doing is the check eventually bounces and then you're out of pocket, right? So um, it's, uh, I think you've got some great advice for sort of cross-checking what, what maybe seems too good to be true, or if you have a red flag or that sort of sense of unease, trust your gut and um, you can back it up um, by cross-referencing and asking your community members. So yeah, they, they are common. You will see a lot of people posting about them in some of the community Facebook groups as well, which is a great way to keep abreast of new scams. Yeah, thank you, Emma. That's great advice. And yeah, all of us have seen scams, right? You've gotten a call saying uh, the CRA is coming for you, or you've gotten an email saying someone took some money from your bank account and now you need to pay it back. It happens all the time. And it's so common in freelancing, whether it's in the form of fake job postings on unreputable, un unreputable websites like Craigslist or Kijiji. Maybe it's people asking for your account information. Maybe they say they wanna help you, but really they wanna steal your information. Maybe they're trying to scam you with that payment method, whether that's checks that bounce, maybe they wanna pay with cryptocurrency or gift cards or uh, a way that seems kind of fishy and it's, it doesn't, it's not quite sitting right. Maybe it's that they're asking you to do a test project to see if your work is up to par. Once you send them the project, they ghost you. They completely leave and cut off all contact with you because, because they wanted that free work without paying. Maybe it's high pay for minimal work. Um, maybe they want to communicate with you off platform if you're using something like Fiverr or Upwork because then it can't be tracked. 
maybe it's a lack of that pre-work agreement or they're asking for uh, your, your, imper uh, your personal sensitive information like your SIN number or financial information uh, for tax documents, but really they might be trying to, you never know, steal your identity or take your money. And that's something you definitely don't want to give to them. So what can you do? What can you do if you see these scams or feel a little bit weird about something? Well, the first thing you can do is you can reach out and ask us. We're always here to help either with resources if you've been scammed or how to figure out if you might be facing a scam. If there, you know, you can report the other person to local law enforcement, especially if there is theft involved. You can also report to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center as well as to your financial institution or bank if you, if you think that your account might be compromised or there is an issue with payment. Uh, that's all different things to think about. And definitely notify the website where the fraud took place, whether that website is Facebook or a specific Facebook page, or if it's uh, Fiverr or Upwork. Uh, please notify those websites. One, it, it, it might protect you, and it will also protect other people from facing this scam in the future. All right. So I want to share some more advice here from Shantae. Shantae shares that a common pitfall with new freelancers is not having a contract set up before they offer services or are paid, which can end up being messy. It's best for both parties in the beginning to understand the details of the work arrangement, what's included, what's not included, rates, payment schedules. As a freelancer, being paid on time for your work and worth is crucial. All right, so I wanna leave us off with a few resources today that are really going to support you in getting your freelance journey started. Like Emma has shared and I've shared, Facebook is an amazing place for uh, support, community, finding clients. Check out the groups we have listed on screen. Take a screenshot. Um, if you need some support, there is the Canadian Freelance Guild, Canadian Media Guild. Upwork has a fantastic resource center. Um, QuickBooks Canada, great for financial information. And again, the Canadian Bar Association for free pro bono legal resources. I wanna just wrap up with one quote here from Corey Gray. He has some great final advice for you all. He says to start small and think big, make sure each project is in your wheelhouse. And I think that advice is so important. Rome wasn't built in a day. Your freelancing business won't be either, right? It takes that time, it takes that effort um, and, and, and it will happen the more you put into it. So start small, think big. I think that's great advice. All right. I do just want to mention quickly that we have a fantastic website from our career services team that hosts a plethora of resources from exploring your career options, finding a job, preparing for work, and managing your career, all tailored to you all, our creative students and alumni. This website also hosts our very first job board, and I know how important that can be for all of you. Um, please, 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 um, please, please, please bookmark this, head back to it. Whether you're looking for the job board or the resources, it's updated frequently. And this is going to be a fantastic resource for you during your time here at TFS and afterwards as well. All right, so I'm just going to pop that link into the chat. Uh, but I do want to say on behalf of Emma and myself, thank you so much for joining today. I hope you learned a lot. Um, we're so thankful to have you here and I'll pass it to Linda who will kickstart our Q&A. Thanks so much, Alex. And thanks also, Emma. That was an outstanding webinar. I am completely blown away by how much valuable information you packed into 50 minutes. Um, a lot of people who dream about uh, being their own boss, um, being self-employed, really just have no idea all of the different things that you need to know and learn about um, and be responsible for um, in terms of uh, reporting to the government and all that sort of thing. And so I think that you've touched on pretty much everything everybody needs to know and be aware of. And I just wanted to reassure you that all of this can be learned. 
Um, I used to work as a business advisor and have worked with a couple of hundred entrepreneurs at the startup stage in my previous career. And um, it does tend to be a little bit of a steep learning curve, but it is all totally learnable. And your dreams of uh, freedom and making money and so on, it's all very possible. And I want to also reassure you that we have uh, the expertise at Career Services. We have a few people on our team that have been self-employed and have done business advising in the past. So if questions come up, then please feel free to reach out and you'll be referred to one of us on the team who has that expertise. Uh, we had some great questions. The chat was just exploding. And so I'm just going to read them out loud. Uh, starting with, if I was self-employed, how long would it take me to be self-sufficient? So in other words, have enough work and enough clients to break even. And this person says, I hear it's five years. What, what's your take on that? I'll give my perspective, but I might kick it back to you, Linda, honestly. Um, it, how long is a piece of string? I've heard, I've heard anywhere from six months to three years, actually, myself. So it really depends on your field. It depends how many clients you're taking on. Are you doing this part-time or full-time? Uh, what's your rate? What's your level of expertise? What's your access to clients? Are you on retainer? There is so much to pack into that, whether when you're going to hit that break even stage and how much profit you're going to make. I will say that if um, it is a source of anxiety for you, if you've got dependents, if you've got big savings goals, then, you know, setting aside time to do a business plan um, at any point in your um, freelancing journey could be really useful to planning your time. What does this six months look like? What does the next year look like? And how are you going to scale up in a way that's manageable and doesn't overextend you? Um, if you have the resources to do so, there are business coaches out there as Linda is, right? There are people out there and you can find some reputable, well-recommended people community groups, um, by word of mouth, who can help you um, sort of set goals for yourself and achieve those and create some accountability there. But I would actually kick it back to you, Linda. What, what do you think is a good time frame for this? If you've been there, done that. Yeah, I think that's uh, probably about accurate, um, Emma. It is wide ranging. Um, there's basically three milestones in your path. One is when you're you're just losing money and that you can expect and the next one is that you break even and that's an important milestone and then after that you can look forward to making money and um, that whole spectrum can take um you know three to five years sometimes less uh, so just be prepared for that and it is entirely possible thank you okay so next question what platforms can i use to find gig work alex <laughs> Yeah, I can definitely take that over. So the platforms you're going to use really do depend on your industry. So it's best to meet with people who are in your industry, determine what they're using. How are they finding clients? A lot of people find clients through word of mouth and referrals, through their friends, through their families, through their classmates even I've been hearing about. So that's one place that you might consider starting. Online, there's tons of resources. Facebook is fantastic, like we've shared for the film and television industry. Uh, you can check out uh, the I Need a Fixer producer group. That's an amazing group for gig work. Um, when it comes to the graphic design industry, there are actually a lot of recruitment agencies who, rec who recruit for smaller contract freelance gigs and projects such as Creative Circle or Creative Niche. So you might wanna look there. You also might want to build organically through social media or through promoting your services online once you've started to develop a little bit um, and, are, and are feeling more comfortable doing so. So there's a ton of ways to find clients. Um, I also want to mention there are platforms like Freelancer, Upwork, Fiverr that really are there to connect your services to clients. And it's a great way. They basically type in, if you've got those keywords in your profile, your profile might show up and there you go. Uh, so there are tons of different uh, ways to find clients uh, and it's about finding the method that works best for you. Excellent, thank you. And I'm gonna conclude the Q&A with one question, which I find really quite intriguing and I'm curious what you have to say. What if I have clients I don't like working with yet I need the money from these contracts? Yeah, I mean, we've all been there, whether that's a boss or a client. I mean, we've all been there. Um, I would wanna dig in. I would wanna have a conversation with you about why you don't like it, but I would start with that. Why don't you like working with this client? What is it about working with this client that just rubs you up the wrong way and makes Monday mornings not so fun? And what can you control about that? 
what boundaries could you start putting in? If they're just micromanaging all the time, then you'd be saying, here's when I answer my emails. I answer them in the mornings. You will get response times then or setting boundaries around the types of revisions that you get. So what is within the sort of control that you have to be able to make that working pro uh, relationship a bit more productive? And then if it's, it's really just, <laughs> if that's not doable, that's not within your circle of control, I would start re-looking at your budget. Could you do without them? You can fire clients, like you don't have to work with people. Or can you start, how are you going to get out? What's your exit strategy for how am I going to hustle for the client that's going to replace them in my income stream? That would be my point of view. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, I think that really covers it, Emma. Um, I know some people, it's really important to outline those clauses or, the, or those terms that Emma was sharing in their contract, right? When are your working hours? Um, what does communication with the client look like? That can all help you uh, before you get started with the client, right? But also having that termination clause, what does it look like? Will you still be paid for your work if you've done half a project, yeah. but not a full project? And now you're really not working well with the client. Um, so those are all different things to consider. Um, one thing I would consider that I've seen a lot of freelancers do is if it's not the right job for you, can you refer the client out? Do you have recommendations on who might be taking on that project? Uh, all different things to consider there. Yeah. I would agree. Um, that is one of the benefits to self-employment is, as Emma was saying, you can fire your clients. Um, just dig deep and think, how much stress is this causing you? And is it worth it to continue um, because you need that money? Um, what price are you paying for that? Um, so yes, and I have a tendency to think that that might be a little bit of paying your dues at the beginning when you're having to um, establish yourself and before you get word of mouth business and so on. And you'll have more freedom to make those kind of choices as you start to get um, more successful in your business. Uh, so that was a fantastic webinar. As I said, I have entered in the chat information on our next webinar. Please join us. That one is taking place on October 11th. The topic is learning about careers in your field. It's one thing to do a degree and then when a graduation is approached and then you start to get stressed, well, what exactly um, am I able to do with this degree? So that is hosted by our employability coach, Amanda Lecce. And the time on October 11th is 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern and 2 p.m. Atlantic time. And I have entered the link in the chat for signing up. So we hope to see you there. Thanks everybody for joining us. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye all. Thanks everyone.